Well, good morning. Welcome to Pumpkin Vine, Sunday School, Bible Study, Life Group. Take any of your pick. Today's focus will be on Luke chapter 4. But I thought before we'd get into the text, we'd talk a little bit about the author, Luke. The Apostle Paul referred to Luke in Colossians 4, 14, as our dear friend Luke, the doctor. Luke is the Bible's only Gentile author. Think about that. He was a compassionate doctor, a thoughtful man of science, and a careful observer of people and events. In Luke 1, 2, he states this by using eyewitness testimony. And he wrote an account in a two-volume um, text uh, on the history of Jesus and the growth of the first century church in the form of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. His Gospel emphasizes that although salvation message uh, was first given to the Jews, it's a still available uh, to everyone. No one's excluded. Um, he also, in his book, talks about those that are on the fringe of society, and he talks about the lost coin. Um, it's available for everyone. He makes reference to the Holy Spirit 20 times in the Gospel of Luke and nearly 60 times in the book of Acts, where he had a front row seat to the unfolding drama and power of the Holy Spirit. Also, he traces uh, Jesus' genealogy back to the first man, Adam. Today, we'll discuss the public proclamation of Jesus' mission revealed to his people in his hometown, Nazareth. And what can be more human than returning home? But we'll see how that the neighbors rejected uh, Jesus that ultimately led to the Jews' rejection of the gospel that opened the door of salvation to the rest of humanity. Uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, for this day for the many blessings. We thank you for Sunday school, Lord, where we can devil into the details of the gospel. And God, we miss uh, gathering with one another, Lord, in the fellowship. And Lord, um, encouraging each other in the spirit, Lord. Uh, today, Lord, we pray, God, that as I, as I try to teach from Luke 4, Lord, that you illuminate my mind, God, and just uh, have me have the words to say, Lord. We pray, Lord, that uh, someone will uh, gather a nugget of truth, Lord, from this lesson today and that will uh, help them, equip them, Lord, to be better uh, Christ followers, Lord, and um, proclaim your word. And, Lord, give us a burden for the lost, dear Heavenly Father. And, Lord, just don't worry about always about our household, Lord, but think about those that are on the fringes of society, Lord, uh, whose life could be dramatically changed, Lord, if they just knew Jesus, Lord. So we thank you for today's lesson, God, and what you're teaching us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's, let's turn uh, to Luke uh, chapter 4, and I'm going to start reading here uh, from uh, 14 through 22, and I hope that uh, you'll follow along with us. It shows about Jesus being rejected at Nazareth. In verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it's written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, 
to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked. So let's just start by saying that, that Luke's gospel is written in chronological order. Thus, as we follow Jesus' timeline in Luke, um, we read that he has already been baptized by John the Baptist. He's been anointed by the Holy Spirit, and he's been tempted and tried uh, 40 days in the wilderness. And we pick up on verses uh, 14 and 15. Uh, we see that Jesus uh, was traveling through the countryside uh, teaching in various synagogues, um, drawing praise from everyone. It says that his reputation uh, preceded him as he traveled. But note here that it says that he was constantly uh, dependent upon the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we get back to our, our settings. He, he went back in verse 16 to Nazareth. He returned to the lower part of Nazareth, his hometown, Nazareth, uh, the place where Joseph and Mary resettled after returning from the uh, flight from Bethlehem to Egypt. Nazareth, a small Jewish, Jewish village of uh, 400 to 500 people. Nazareth, where everyone knew everyone kind of like Dallas was when I grew up, only had a one red light, you knew everyone. And then, uh, go, skipping along, along 16, it said it was the Sabbath day, and um, it was his habit or his custom uh, that Jesus entered the synagogue. In verse 17, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and rolling it, he found the place where it's written. It was customary in the service for a public reading of the scriptures. <clears throat> this was uh, rotated among the members, the family members of the synagogue. Um, and we don't know whether or not it was uh, Jesus' family's turn or whether there being some uh, news about him or his reputation that preceded him. Uh, they wanted to give him the honor. But anyway, uh, it the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was, was handed to him. And, um, but we're not sure exactly why he, he was chosen to, to read. <clears throat> but usually after the reading of the scriptures, there would be a discussion of the scriptures uh, or the purpose. And, and the uh, passage that Jesus stood up to read was in Isaiah, original text is Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, and Isaiah um, 58, 6. Um, so let's, let's reread that. So he stood up and read, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord. Um, we, we need to understand why Isaiah wrote this scripture and then why Jesus would come back and, and uh, quote it. Uh, Isaiah the prophet used it when the uh, Israelites were deported to Babylon uh, during the great Babylon exile. Uh, they were held in captivity and Isaiah saw uh, uh, through the Lord's vision that, that they weren't to remain there, that they were going to be able to uh, return to their homeland. So his prophecy was an encouragement to them that one day they would be free. Now roll back 700 years, uh, Jesus read these words, but he had a lot different implication because his words were far more significant 
because his words were not talking to the Israelites that were held in captivity, but to all of us who have held in the captivity of our sin and whose natural fate would be hell and damnation. Jesus' words were directed at the ultimate fulfillment for believers as, as you were free from the penalty of sin. In Isaiah uh, 21, he, he talks about, uh, our, in Luke 21, he talks about to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And then he sat down and then all eyes were uh, upon him. And can you imagine the, uh, the significance of the silence of what he said? Uh, today as you listen, the scripture has been fulfilled. So Jesus was proclaiming publicly in a public setting who he was, the savior of the world, <clears throat> and what his mission was. His mission was to restore and deliver God's people. But before we gloss over this passage, think of Jesus, who it says that he grew up in that town and was a child and it was his customer, custom to go to the synagogue was fully divine and fully man going to the synagogue every Sabbath day uh, and hearing people stand up and read the text prophesizing about him as he sat in their midst all the while silent. Um, later on in his ministry, Jesus spoke uh, about to the Jews about the prophecies that they had studied. In fact, in John... Uh, 5.46, he wrote, or, or quoted as, as saying uh, to the Jews, if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Um, the Jews loved Moses. He was highly esteemed and, and loved and respected. Uh, he's the in, uh, inspired author. When I say he's author inspired by the Holy Spirit, of the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. Um, and so what did what did Moses write about Jesus? Well, we, we see there in, in Genesis uh, 3.15, uh, which really is the first prophecy of, of the gospel, the good news. And so let's read Genesis 3.15. And I will put in a entity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. I sort of break that down. Uh, the coming of the woman's offspring was fulfilled in Jesus' birth. And, and on the cross, Jesus' body was struck, struck bruised, broken, but not destroyed. But at the second coming, Moses is prophesizing that Satan's head will be crushed and destroyed. You know, this is just one of 400 Old Testament prophecies about Jesus. It's been recorded by Dr. Peter W. Stoner, a mathematician and an astronomy professor, wrote a book about this, and he calculated that says that just that eight prophecies, just eight of 400, that to come true in one person by coincidence was like the odds of one to the 10th to the 17th power. Uh, to illustrate this, to kind of get a graphic idea of what that number represents, and Dr. Stoner determined that the odds would be like a man finding one marked silver dollar bill uh, coming from a pool of silver dollar bills, uh, covering the land mass of the size of Texas two feet deep, and just coincidentally reaching down and grabbing that uh, marked silver dollar. But back to a text here, it says in verse 22, all spoke well of him, and they were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked. 
you know, initially his hometown folks probably uh, had a good reputation. Jesus had a good reputation and they were amazed and they gave them affirmation. But it was short lived because they were so familiar with Jesus. They, they knew his father. It says they knew Joseph. I'm sure they knew his brothers, sisters and mothers. And then doubt, which always starts, and then rejection followed. But um, let's go on to our text and that uh, Jesus predicted that he would be rejected just like the prophet. So let's read in uh, Luke chapter 4, verses 23 uh, through 27. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, Do here in your hometown what you had heard, what you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, continue, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet <clears throat> Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zavathath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosies in the time of Elisha, the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman, the Sincerian. So Jesus, in, in, in discussing with them, is linking himself back up to the uh, prophets, Elijah and Elisha. Um, to the prophets throughout the history Israel had always rejected them. And, and these two prophets uh, were prophets of the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, and yet <clears throat> their blessings uh, were often addressed to the outside of the nation because of unfaithfulness uh, and disobedience of Israel. Uh, it says during a famine, uh, there were widows. And, and the Bible tells us to take care of the widows. Elijah uh, didn't go to the many widows in Israel. You, you know there had to be very many. But he went to a widow in uh, Zarephath in the region of Sidon uh, that, who was a Gentile. Uh, this story is told in 1 Kings 17, 8 through 24. And then Elisha uh, could have helped many leopards there were many leopards there in Israel, uh, but he reached out and helped uh, the leopard uh, Naaman, who was also a Gentile. In 2 Kings, uh, we see that that story is told in chapter 5, verses 1 through 19. And so, just like Elijah and Elisha turned their back on the Israel of the needy, uh, Jesus saying that because of the rejection of, of Nazareth and the Jews, that he's going to take his message and, and blessings elsewhere. Um, today that we know that God has done that, he's opened the door of salvation and as many blessings uh, from Jesus, and, but he's taken that worldwide outside the borders of Israel. So our third point, is that Jesus continues his ministry dis, despite rejection. And so we'll finish up here in our scripture in uh, Luke 4, verses 28 through 32. So if you'll follow along with me, I'll read that. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, they drove them out of town, and they took them to the brow of the hill in which the town was built in order to throw him off a cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. And then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee. And on the Sabbath, he taught the people. And they were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. You know, uh, going back to our text where they had doubts and, and uh, the rejection and... and uh, uh, hostility was building uh, basically they were trying to manipulate Jesus 
And it was when they couldn't manipulate them, uh, it turned there um, to, to wanting to kill them. They plotted to, to kill Jesus. Um, and think about the irony of this. Here, Jesus uh, has returned to his hometown, the people of his hometown, his home crowd, um, possibly family and friends, uh, people that he had shared experiences with and had much in common. Um, and yet they had rejected him. Uh, the town of Nazareth uh, sits along the eastern face of a mountain. And one of the features that you'll find today is a perpendicular wall of rock, some 40 uh, to 50 feet high, which could have just been the spot for them to carry out their murderous design. Uh, yet in verse 30, let's, let's just go back and read that. <clears throat> but he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Um, to many, just with Jesus uh, walking away untouched, maybe that doesn't seem like a miracle of the, uh, the few uh, the fishes and the loaves feeding the 5,000, uh, but it shows God's sovereignty. Uh, God has a plan for our lives <clears throat> that's not dependent on circumstances. Here, it's not dependent on the hostility or the rejection of the crowd or our peers in Jesus' case. Uh, Jesus is quoted in John 2, 4, my hour has not yet come. Jesus always had a sense of uh, his appointed time. Uh, the lesson that we as Christians should take is although we never know what a today may bring, our days are in the Lord's hand, and we can trust him to take us to his appointed end. I know most of you could testify how God has physically protected from you from your demise, and yet there are many more instances of God's protection that we don't know any about. <clears throat> I remember running off the road one time, and I was in a little car and I was spinning in the middle of the road and there was there was traffic coming in both ways. And, <clears throat> and instead of fighting the wheel, I just took my hand off the wheel. And for some reason, I know it's God's design, uh, the, the karma gear that I was in just straightened itself up and went in reverse, just like a shot, and landed on top of a bankman with the, the front tires uh, spinning. Uh, I got out of it and had a guy there came and the, the car was so small and we just picked it up and uh, it, I drove out of the pasture and then went on to scoot. But those are kind of uh, stories that I'm sure that you could tell. But, you know, reading about this, <clears throat> we see that uh, there's many today and in, in our Christian brothers that preach prosperity, gospel, or, or wealth and health. And admittedly, uh, there are times when God really uh, blesses somebody in his, in his sovereign judgment. We, you know, we don't understand that. But being a Christian is not a ticket uh, to an easy life. You know, just look at look at these scriptures today, and, and as you study Jesus' life, all the rejection that uh, he came, not even counting what he went through there on the cross, the flogging that he went through and and and, and dying on the cross where it, uh, crucifixion was so horrendous that they outlawed. The Romans said it was too cruel and, and no longer did that. But as we think about the, today's time and, and time draws closer for Christ to uh, return in his fullness, you know, we're going to face op oppositions, both spiritual and and physical and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit we must press on in pursuing Christ and when our duty is to share the gospel with the world even when we face rejection uh, Christ is our example here is he's our role model of how we're supposed to live in the face of rejection and we must remain faithful to it you know, after escaping um, 
from being thrown off the mountain, uh, Jesus went back to doing God's will. And it's right here in our text. Uh, the next day, in verse uh, 4, 31, 32, then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and the Sabbath day taught the people. And they were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. So you see by our text that Jesus never gave up. He pressed on. One day he's almost uh, thrown off uh, uh, and risking his life. Remember, he's, he's fully man as well as fully God. And, and the next day he gets up and goes down to the next town speaking. And it seems that the people there are receptive to his word because they were amazed at his teaching because his word has authority point I want to leave you with is that Jesus never gives up. He sits at the right hand of God Almighty today. He's there making intercessions to the Father for our sins. And you know, one day we will pass over. And he'll be there in the future. It could be today that we pass over. But he'll wait for all of us who uh, trusted him as our Savior to join him in eternal bliss. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for today's lesson, God, and for the lessons that Jesus has shown us, dear Heavenly Father. Uh, Lord, we just ask you to take, let us take that to our heart, God. Lord, during these times, we, we see opposition now, Lord, uh, coming from all directions, Lord. But God, let us never give up, just like Jesus never gave up and has never given up. God, help us to pursue and always uh, go towards the goal of doing uh, the Lord's will. And Lord, I ask you just to bless today. Lord, just bless uh, Preacher Don and his uh, message today, Lord. God, equip our hearts, Lord, and our minds, Lord, to be receptive to hear uh, the words that he may speak. Uh, God, forgive us of our sins and our missions as well as what we do intentionally, Lord. And Lord, just help us to uh, uh, keep on keeping on, Lord. And all this we pray in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.